Welcome to Kuvulu, the sorcery of copper. In this episode, we'll talk about toner cartridges. We'll see how they know how much toner there still is inside and we'll even reverse the chip so we can pretend that there is still some toner left while it says there is none. There we have it, the printer is dying on me again. As you can see, the toner is low and this only means one thing. It is time to change the toner cartridge. But how does the printer actually know that there is almost no toner anymore in this cartridge? Is there some kind of sensor or something like that? Well, there is only one way to find out. Take the cartridge apart. This is how the cartridge looks like once taken apart. And there are not a lot of parts. On the back here, we can see the toner of the reservoir. It's just a plastic container filled with small black particles because this is for black toner. Here, this roll here is called the magnetic roll and it's there to get the toner out of the reservoir to the outside world. If we turn it, this is how it brings it out, then on the roller you have lots of small particles, black particles, the toner. On top of that you see the, mag uh, the doctor blade. This control how much toner gets out of the outside world, to the outside world from the reservoir. Then the toner gets transferred to this organic photoconductor drum. This is charged electrostatically and then an infrared laser will remove the electrostatic discharge so actually no toner sticks on it. And when there is some electrostatic charge, then the toner gets transferred on it and when there is none, there will be no toner. Afterwards the paper comes and the toner is pressed against the paper and it, when it's warm, it sticks to the paper. And in the end, we have the wiper blade, which is there to remove the remaining toner from the drum, so the printing can start all over again. And this is how you do the transfer of the toner from here to the paper and do the actual printing. But if we look again at this reservoir, we see there are no metal contacts. We need some metal contacts if we want to do any measurements, or at least electronic measurements, and find out how much toner there is. But everywhere you look around, we don't see anything where we can contact to read some kind of value or to perform some kind of measurements on this cartridge. There's nothing. So how the hell does a printer know that there is no toner anymore in this cartridge? Well, if you look at the pieces again, you see this one here. There are some pads, the two pads here. This is part of an electronic circuit, and here is the small board. And that's all you need. All the information is stored in there. If we have a look inside the printer, we see these metal contacts here, which actually made with the cartridge. On this side with these metal contacts. And then the board, which was sitting just on the top left corner, which I took apart, these two contacts, they will, or these two pads, they will make contact with these two metal pieces which are on the back. If we look on the side of the printer, we see one board. If we take apart, we see the springs from the contact. And these springs again make contact with these metal pads or with these metal pieces right here. And because on the board there's written high voltage and we see a lot of transformer, I expect this board only to be there to control or to generate electromagnetic electrostatic charges for the drum. And but the chip which contacts here on these metal pieces, these metal pieces are contacted by these two red and black wires and they go back along with the cables from all the cables from this board they go to the other side up to this board this is whoop, this is actually the main board and which does all the calculation and it is actually the brain here we see again the two wires so this is the bundle i think this one is the bundle i don't remember exactly but here we have the two wires coming from this chip which go actually directly to this board. And then 
the main CPU, which is right here, will take care of communicating with this chip and do whatever it needs to do. But this main board is not what is interesting us for now. This is interesting us. This is the culprit. This is the one telling the printer, hey, there's no toner anymore in this cartridge. But based on the top markings of this chip, I wasn't able to identify what kind of chip it is. Um, this is just in a TOSP6 package, but this doesn't look like at all like a sensor. Also, it wouldn't make sense to use a sensor to put a sensor on the outside shell of the container where this chip or this electronic circuit was. If you want to measure how much toner there is in the container, you should put one sensor in the container. And it would measuring the level of toner would be a lot more complicated than just one single chip, or at least I think so. So probably they do it the other way. They don't measure, but they know how much chip how much toner there is in the container. So whenever you buy the cartridge, in this chip, they store the information, there is this amount of toner. And when the printer prints, it measures or it calculates, it actually just calculates, it calculates the amount of toner it will use and then it will communicate with this chip and update the toner level which is saved in there. So whenever you use it, the amount which is in there will just decrease. So in the end, you just need to store the amount of, in, uh, of toner which is just a basic information. So what you just need memory, you don't need any sensor. So it will not represent the toner level inside, but it gives an estimate and apparently it works good enough. It's cheap at least. This is just memory. And because you only need to store one information, the amount of toner, you don't need a lot of memory. You don't need flash. EEPROM is sufficient enough and provides enough memory. Now we also have these two pads. This, this pad, oh, the other way around actually, this pad was connected to the black wire on the printer, which is ground. This pad was connected to the red wire on the printer, which is VCC. But because you need also some communication, this pad is probably also some data communication. And there is one well-known protocol which actually allows you to do this, which is called one wire, because it uses a single wire on top of ground to have data communication and power. It is then called parasitic power. If you also look at the pad, so if I short it, you would hear a beep. This pad only goes to pin 2, which is right here, and not, whoop, and not to any other pin. This pad, you can see the trace, only goes to pin 1, and none of the other pins. So. On pin 1 we have ground, on pin 2 we have data and VCC. And this pretty much matches actually one wire EEPROM, which is very often has uses this pinout and there are chips in this package. So my guess is that this is one wire EEPROM. So I said this is pin 1 because here there is the dot on the chip and this is on the left top corner and it indicates pin 1. If you look at the board, you see that the one who used the footprint added here a mark for pin 1, which should be this pin, and here some kind of indication for the top notch, which is generally on top of the package, and on the left side there is pin 1. But I think they make a mistake, because this notch in uh, this dot on the chip indicates pin 1 in all cases. I haven't seen any other case. I've connected the chip back to the printer, but using these crocodiles clip. Here, they are touching the pads, and on the back here, they are touching the metal sheets of the printer, where the wires go to the main board. This what would allow us to do is using these two probes here, which on the logic analyzer, sniff the communication between the main board and this chip. Our assumption is that it is one wire EEPROM. Let's check it. Here we have pulse view, so we can record the communication between the printer and the chip using the logic analyzer. And let's start the capture. Let's start the printer. Oh, and here we see, let's see, let's wait until we see some traffic. The printer needs to warm up a bit. Ah, and see, here we see already some communication. 
that's perfect and to check if we actually if this is actually the one wire protocol let's add the one wire link layer decoder and as we can see tick, 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 this is the whole trace this is when the printer started and this is where the communication started and we can see here in the beginning we just have the warning while the printer was started but then we have no errors and we can decode all the bits so this seems really to be the one wire protocol but what is the one wire protocol to see how the one wire protocol works we'll use the datasheet of the DS28E05 it's a um, one wire EEPROM and the important part here is one wire. It's a rather short data sheet and this allows us to give a good overview of how the protocol works, but it doesn't give all the details. If you want to learn more about it, I rather recommend the book of iButton standards, I think that's how it's called. But for now, this data sheet is plenty sufficient to see and to have an overview of how the one wire protocol works. But before we talk about the protocol in details, we have to find out how to connect the devices. This is illustrated here in this hardware configuration. The one wire protocol is a or bus system. It includes the word bus, meaning we have multiple devices on the same line. In this case, we have one bus master and we have one one wire slave. So one master, one slave in this case. But we can have more than just so this is one time but we can have a lot more slaves in practice you can have also multiple masters but this is not defined and this is not the intent of the one wire specification and also not all cases are covered and all conflicts are conf covered compared to i2c for example but as the name says one wire we only need one wire plus the ground to do everything to receive data and to transmit data from the master and also on the slaves we can receive data and we can transmit data simply using one wire and like in i2c if you want to have multiple devices talking on the same wire you often use it in open drain or, or open collector mode here you can see open drain mode what this means is that per default the line is pulled high using this resistor here so if nobody is sending it's transmitting something or is putting in three state mode this is high and then if you want to transmit something you use here this open this mosfet to actually pull it low so in this case the mosfet is only on the slave side on the master side you see that we have here some driver what this allows you to do is that on top of being able to receive and transmit data you can drive this line and po provide power to trap some internal capacitor in the slave and then whenever the slave pull it low pulls it low it still uses the energy in this capacitor meaning that you don't need a separate line to provide voltage you only have this one wire line to provide voltage so enough power to to start and data communication and if you provide if you use it in this mode it is called parasitic power sometimes it's even enough to just let the pull up resistor if it's strong enough provide the power and you don't need it to to even drive it sometimes you do sometimes you don't it really depends on the device and on the specification on the pull up resistor and so on but the protocol allows you to do that which is rather nice so we've talked about one bus master and one slave and since we have one master we know that this will initiate the communication and coordinate communication to it from it to all slave devices for starting to talk there is the initialization procedure which starts with the reset pulse as you can see here the master is sending a reset pulse how it does that is pull this one wire low here you can see that in bold we have activity of the master and it pulls it low for a certain amount of time here t reset low t r s t l and in this case i think it is more than 48 microseconds <coughs> sorry microseconds but you will have to look in the data sheet what exactly the the value is it's not the same across all one wire devices although it should 
it isn't. After that, it's here. The master stops driving this line of stops pulling it low, and then the resistor, which we see here, will pull it again high. And this is when the slave, all the slaves, so in this case, this is just this one, but all the slaves which are on the bus should pull the line low. This is what we call the present spells, and this allows the master to know, wow, oh, there are one wire devices on the bus, I can start talking. And afterwards, the slaves stop, pull it low, it goes high again, and the master can actually start the communication. This is also the disinitiation procedure starts a transaction. Now you can send and receive bits. And this is how this is done. Now for sending a bit, the master will again pull it low for a short amount of time. And then at this point, it will decide do I want to transmit a zero or a one. In case it wants to transmit a zero, it will stop pulling it low and the resistor will pull it high again within this time. I think it's two microseconds, something like that. If it wants to transmit a zero, it will put pull the line low for a lot longer time. And the slave can actually sample at this point. And if it's if the line is high at this point, it's a one. If the line is low, is low, it's a zero. And after some time, the T slot time, I think in this case this is at least 13 microseconds. You can you have uh, you can do this again. So you have still a minimum of T rec for recovery. This is the minimum of amount of time it should be high before transmitting the or receiving the next bit. This is how the master can write zeros and ones, but to read the thing, it is almost the same principle. Here the master pulls it low in the beginning, and at this point it start it stops pulling it low. But if the device knows it wants to transmit a zero or one, it will decide to pull low or not. So at this point, if the device wants to transmit, or the slave wants to transmit a one, it will not pull it low, which will let the resistor pull it high again, this way it transmits a high. If the slave wants to transmit a zero, it continues pulling it low, and the master is not pulling it low again uh, anymore. <coughs> but the line is still low because one of the slaves is pulling it low, and after some time it will also stop pulling it low. Then we here we have the recovery time again, and the master can start transmitting or receiving the next bits. So here we have a zero, uh, uh, a zero, and this is how you transmit data. You can read or write once, and you can read or write zero, and you always sample at the same time to figure out if it's a one or a zero within this slot. Now. This is for sending, for transmitting bits, reading and writing. Now you have to know when to read, when to write, and what to read and what to write. But this is not defined in the link layer. So this is the link layer. And now to figure out what to send and what to send, when to send it, we have the network layer. And after the initiation procedure, what you do is you send or the master sends a ROM function command. This is just one byte, which you see here, it can have multiple values, and it defines what actions you want to do. And in the first place, you, the master has to say or to define with which slave it wants to talk to, like in I2C when you send the address. In this case, for example, if you only have one, one wire device or one slave on the bus, you don't need actually to select it. You just say skip ROM using this code here. And the only device which is on the bus knows, okay, the master wants to talk to me now. If you have multiple devices though, you have to transmit the address. In this case, the address is called ROM ID. And if you want to transmit it, you have the match ROM command. This is the corresponding byte. And after the master sends the uh, match ROM command, it will send the ROM ID of the slaves it wants to talk to. And the ROM ID is defined right here. 
this is the kind of address like in i2c it's 64 bits you have 8 bits of family code this tells you what kind of device it is and for example 0d stands for the ds28e05 family nope this should be a 5 after the family code you have a unique 48 bit number for this family code and this should be unique per device for this family code the manufacturer should ensure that and this rom id is burned into rom you cannot set it it is already burned into rom and in the end you have a csc code to be sure that the transmission is actually not faulty and the line is correct and so on but when you want to select a device you need to send its address using the match rom command but because it is in the device you first have to know the address so whenever you want whenever you have only one device on the bus you can also issue the read rom and instead of sending the id the only device the only slave device will transmit the id its id so the master can actually know it so if you have multiple devices on the bus and want to talk to them this is what you should do in the beginning to know how uh, before you put the multiple devices in the bus so you have the rom ids now if you didn't read out the rom ids before putting multiple devices on the bus there is also another command which is called search rom it's a quite nice technique to actually enumerate all the rom ids on on the bus for all the slaves on the bus but because in our case we only have one slave being the toner chip and one master being the printer mainboard we will not talk about this you can read out about the algorithm later on but that's it this is how you select the rom and after you selected the rom you can start the memory function command in this case this is memory because we have eprom but other devices have other commands but the function command is the same idea it is one byte after you selected the slaves which tells what you want to do and in this case you either read memory or you write memory what you first do is send one byte which is the function command code which defines what you want to do and depending on that the master and the slave will know what the following procedure is to either read data or write data or do whatever the device wants to do but this is also where one wire stops it doesn't define all the functions this is per device but with that we know how the one wire protocol works and we can now analyze the traffic between the printer and the toner chip this is the traffic we've recorded of the communication between the printer and the toner chip we've already added the one wire link layer decoder because we wanted to confirm it is one wire communication and now if we look into the details we can be sure that it is actually the one wire protocol because all the timings are correct so on the top here you can see the timing values and also all the signalings are correct so first we send a reset pulse or the master is sending the reset pulse and the slave is transmitting the present pulse now we know this is sent by the master and we know this is sent by the slave because we know how the one wire link layer protocol works the decoder will not tell you this immediately or even if you look just at the traffic on the one wire you don't know who is doing what but because of the knowledge we gained we can decode a lot better what's happening and if we want to transmit bits we have short pulses for bit 1 and long pulses for bit 0 and all the timing match quite well now this is just a link layer we now want to be able and want to see what the traffic is so what the commands are and so on and for that we will stack on top of the link layer the network layer protocol decoder this decodes the bits and packs it into all the commands which are needed uh, here these are bytes and we know that the first byte after the initialization procedure is the rom command here this is 0xcc and this corresponds to skip, skip rom and it makes sense that the printer is issuing this command because the printer doesn't know all the IDs of all the toner cartridges in the world to select that. But what it knows it 
there is only one toner cartridge on my one wire bus so i don't really care about its rom id because there is only this one so i can immediately start talking to it so i'm skipping sending rom and i'm already transmitting the function command code which you see here this is this one byte but again if you look if you remember from the data sheet this we had two rom command codes we had 55 which was for read memory and f0 for write memory now in this case the master issued the command code a5 it doesn't correspond to any of the two functions we saw from the data sheet so at least this chip is not simple one wire eprom as defined by the ds28e05 data sheet it must be something else and most of the very simple eprom have these two commands f0 oh sorry uh, yeah f0 for write memory and 55 for read memory let's have a look at uh, the the next command so this is here here we see again before we start the transaction we have the reset and presence pulse for initialization for initializing the communication and then we have the skip problem command and the next function command code is 0f this again doesn't correspond to our eprom datasheet we had f0 for write, com write memory but not 0f so again this shows us hmm, it is not simple and dumb eprom memory or not at least ds2805 now i cheated a bit because i skipped in between here this is now i explain why here you see it doesn't use skip rom but the printer wants actually to know the rom id of the slave device and it's allowed to do so because there is only one device on the bus so it can issue the read rom command and get the actual rom id which we see here up so these are the 64 bits of the rom id now you have to know that eprom you send least significant bit first and least significant bit first so this is decoded but if you would have to look at the traffic this would be b3 and so on with this being least significant bit <coughs> but once it is decoded here and this corresponds to the rom id and on the rom id the last byte was the family code and in this case we have family code b3 now on the data sheet of the ds28 or e05 data sheet uh, rom code the family code was defined as 0d so this confirms this is not this simple eprom because it doesn't have the right family code and it doesn't have the corresponding function codes now we need to find out which device has family code b3 there's several lists of family codes for one wire devices and there is even one provided by Maxim Integrated which does manufacture a lot of one wire devices. This is application node 155 for their software but their software is also there to identify their products. And if we look at table one family code reference you have a list of family codes which part number it corresponds to and a short description of the part which what it does. Now what we saw in the trace was the family code B3. Sadly this is not in the list. The last entry is 43 and there is nothing afterwards. But this list is not very complete and not exhaustive because if you remember from the DS28E05 one wire EEPROM which is also manufactured by Maxim well the device code, the family code was 0D if we look here we have 0c and 0f but no 0d so it is not very exhaustive we have to look for another list this is another list which is quite good from ovfs project and then ovfs doc there are a couple of more devices and there is also the b3 which is quite good this stands for mtc002 but i looked at this and this is a thermocouple this is for a thermocouple or a thermocouple converter to read temperature values this is definitely not what our chip is this is not for there is no sensor or thermocouple to bind to it there's no thermocouple inside and it's just memory so 
this entry is not accurate, at least for our need, because this B3 family code should only be unique for your families or for your parts within a manufacturer. Now, other manufacturers might still able to reuse them or to reuse or to use the other one because one didn't define it or you don't know that one defined it or just simply because you don't care what one defined. It's better if you have your unique one, but you don't have to. Probably in this case, one manufacturer used B3 for the thermocouples and another manufacturer which produces the chip for Ortona used it for something else, for a memory device. So this doesn't help. But if we look further, there is yet another table which is a bit different, still for the same OVFS project or WFS project. And what this is a bit different is that it has the command codes. So here you have the family codes. B3 is not in this list, but on there you still have the command codes. You also have the command codes, which are quite useful because we have something which uses the command code A5. So in this color, it's for the ROM functions, ROM function commands. This is for the memory function commands or whatever function commands the devices uses. We saw A5, but let's have a closer look. So I will use this program to list them. Sigrock CLI. I presented PulseView and PulseView is quite a nice tool to have the visual uh, the visual representation of the trace. You can see the trace going up and down, you can see the timing, you can browse around quite easily. So as graphical interface, it's perfect. But what we want now is really the data which we saw in a machine parsable way. For that, Sigrock CLI is quite useful. They both use the same library, the lib Sigrock decode, which has a list of Sigrock decoders for all different protocols and so on. So with this tool, you provide the input file. Here in this case, uh, I saved the trace we had in printer.sr. You tell it what decoder you want to use. We have one wire link and one wire network, network on top of one wire link. And we only want the annotations for the one wire network. And if we run it, we see we see the same thing that we saw in the graphical interface, but we don't have the timing information anymore. We just have the traffic information which is exactly what we want. Now we only want the data after the ROM command, which corresponds to the memory function command. So we have, if we want this, we just want the one line after the ROM command from this one. So here we have the ROM command and just after it, the one line, which corresponds to the memory function command. Okay, let me tune it a bit better, grip data to only get the memory function commands. Here we have the all functions command which are used. This is only A5, 0F and AA. So if we go back to our table, we have, we need one device which uses A5, AA, so these two lines here, and 0F, which is right here. So it has to use all three of them and you go through them. It's not the time chip, for example, you go through, through, through. I won't spare you with the research, but at some point you will land on this one, which is an EEPROM, what we're looking for. And it has some more thing. It's protected EEPROM. The part is called 2432. TS2432 is provided by Maxim Integrated. And this is one wire EEPROM, which matches what we have. Plus on top of that, they have a SHA-1 engine. Now SHA is a cryptographically secure hash, or at least it was secure, it's not that secure anymore. There are some weaknesses, but it's still, it's still not bad. It's not the weakest one. And what this is used for is for message authentication codes to authenticate. And if you look at the application users, we have device authentication and ta-da, ink and toner cartridges. So this perfectly matches our case. We have a chip with memory, which is storing the toner level and which is protected, which provides authentication. Now, why would you want authentication on a toner chip? Well, simply 
to be sure to be sure that the toner cartridge you bought is genuine. You don't want all this counterfeit crap because they don't know how you build the printer. They don't have the exact right parts to print correctly. Um, and if you provide other parts, it might damage your printer. You don't want anyone to, to damage your printer and have better results. So you want the user to use only genuine one, which is good for your printer. Also, counterfeit might use bad toner. You only want to provide good toner. And last, but probably the most important point, well, toner is pretty expensive and print, uh, printer manufacturers don't make a lot of money out of printers. I'm even surprised they can make any profit out of it. What they make money off and a lot is the toner and the ink. This is the main revenue. So you don't want any counterfeit toner or ink cartridges. And to avoid having counterfeit ones, you, pro you have to use an authentication or you can use and an authentication method. And this way, they authenticate the chip which is on the toner to be sure that this toner which is plugged in has been provided by them. We still want to have a look at the data sheet because we want to compare if the function commands correspond to our trace or to what we have. So the data sheet here, we can only download the abridged version. If you want the full one, we have to request the NDA, probably because it has something to do with crypto and protection. It's very important. So, but still, let's have a look at this one for the DS2432. One wire protected, one kilobyte, one wire EEPROM with SHA-1 engine. And the pinout still corresponds. Pin one is ground, pin two is the one wire. And if we go downwards, we see the first problem here. We want the memory function commands, but they're not provided. For details, see the full version of the data sheet. This is a pain. Uh, they're removing it, <laughs> maybe because it's a security chip, I don't know. But they're using a normal, a cryptographically secured hash algorithm, or at least it was at that time, SHA-1. And this has been reviewed by a lot of people to be sure that it is, or it was, secure. And here they're just removing it and doing security by obscurity. This is really a pain. This doesn't make the product more secure. This just slows down. And for the, manif for the, for the programmer, it's a pain in the ass. It's, it won't stop any evil counterfeit market. And they even go to the trouble or to, to the point that the family code here is not listed. There's a small star telling that for the actual family code, seal the full, refer to the full version of the data sheet. Really a pain. I mean, there is no reason to, to remove this information. This just will slow it a bit down, but it won't stop us because we know that one wire has been defined by Dallas Semiconductors. At, at some point, this was integrated into Maxim integrated, but it wasn't always this case. And Dallas Semiconductors, this is why also you always have the DS and then the part number, DS2432, for example, here, because Dallas Semiconductors. So look around for old data sheet where they probably didn't remove everything. And if you look at this, site which archives all data sheets so datasheetcatalog.com you will find one data sheet from Dallas Semiconductors which looks like this it's for the same chip but this data sheet is older and although it is older if you look around tada, we have all the memory function commands which is quite great we even have the family code which they tried to, to remove out of security I don't know the family code was 33, while well, we have B3, close enough. It's not the right one, but let's still have a look at the function commands, which are here. Here, memory and SHA function commands. Here, 0F, it is write scratch pad. We ha also had AA, which is read scratch pad, and we also had A5, which is further down. But what's good here is that it describes in details how the function commands look like, so how many bytes of data should be sent, what it means, and so on. So we can use this information to actually check if the traffic corresponds to this chip, corresponds to these commands, and if this is the case, then we have a good lead. So let's verify from the trace if the function commands we have, or if the commands we have, m match what is described here. 
already mentioned that Pulseview uses the libsigrog decode library to have these protocol decoders and so the results we can see. But this project is open source, which is quite neat because what it allows you to do is to understand how it works. And well, before I started the project, or when I started the project, the one wire link layer decoder wasn't pre working quite right for for my setup or for my traces it might work right for other traces but for my traces there were some decoding errors so what i did is understood what the error is and i actually re-implemented the one wire link layer decoder so it decodes everything properly and for that i just needed the um, data sheet of this protocol to implement it and now it works pretty much pretty well for my my trace and it works also nice for the previous trace which was uh, they are in the existing because they are also example dumps. Now, even more than just modifying the existing one, you can write your own protocol decoders, and this is what I did. So, on top of the network link layer, we can now add the DS2432 protocol decoder, which I implemented thanks to the datasheet, and we can now find out what exactly, or a, a lot better, what the chip is doing, or what the interaction is, the communication is. So while previously we had just data 0 to the 0f and we didn't know to which function command it was uh, mapping, because we have the data sheet, we can now decode that. And we see that this one is just means write scratch pad. And afterwards, the two next bytes are the target address and then the data you want to write. And this is coded, decoded pretty quite neatly. You can even do CSC checksums and so on. And as we can see here, all the trace has been decoded using this protocol decoder I implemented and it matches pretty well. So there is nothing which is uh, which has an error, there are no fields which are too long, there are no fields which are too short. So based on that, we can pretty much assume that the chip we have is a clone of or just a rebranding of something else, but it is implementing the DS2432 has a different family code but the trace is exactly it co corresponds quite well there can still be cases where the trace could match although the this is not what is intended but at this point the probability is quite low particularly when we read what's going on it makes a lot of sense so instead of now using the GUI to understand or to to, to have a look let's rather have a look on the command line with Sigrog CLI. So here on top of the one wire network protocol decoder, I've added the DS2432 protocol decoder that we just wrote, and we will just look at these annotations to understand what is happening and what is going on. And this is the decoded trace. So, what does the printer do? The first thing it does is read an authentic, uh, authenticated page. And this is the data, and it reads the data at this address, which is corresponds to memory page 1. But what it doesn't do is read the authentication part, we'll see later on why. It reads the ROM code, and I was surprised because it doesn't need really to know the ROM code, there's only one device on the, on the bus, why would it want to read the ROM code, just for informative purposes? We don't know. Then. Write scratchpad and read scratchpad. We'll see why it does that. And then again, read authenticated page. Here we have the address. So this is memory page zero. Here we have the corresponding data, the 32 bytes of data, which are in data memory page zero. The padding, the CSC on of the data to be sure that there is no transmission error. And then the important part, the message authentication code. This data is authenticating or this well this data here is authenticating this data but not only this is where the sha1 function comes into play for authentication sha1 takes as many bytes as you want as input and then produces a fixed amount of bytes as output this is what we see here and it is cryptographically secure so whatever you have the output it is pretty hard to guess what is the input and this serves as authentication. Now, why authentication? So the input for this data is obviously the data itself, because we want to authenticate this data. It's also the address. And here, this part, this is a challenge which is sent to the chip. 
this is why you first write the challenge to the scratch pad then you read the challenge on the scratch pad to ensure that you actually have the the right challenge the same challenge what's also in there is used for calculating the hash function is the rom so the rom id of the chip is used in the sha calculation to do this authentication code and this is why the printer needs to actually know the rom because it also needs to compute this message authentication code on its side and then compare to it this is how you can ensure or you can authenticate the chip you you know the address you know the data you know the challenge you know the rom id so you can do the same computation and generate the same message authentication code and if the message authentication the code is the same then the data is authenticated now there's one last part which is not in here which is used for this message authentication code which is the secrets there is a secret stored in the toner chip which is also fed into the sha1 functions and which produces the message authentication code now as the name mentions secret this is something which is unknown to any outsider so you cannot read the secret out from the chip itself the secret is shared between the cpu or the printer and the toner chip and it is stored in the toner chip so you cannot read it out what this allows you to do is that the message authentication code is only correct if you have the exact same secret and since it is a secret only the manufacturer or only the one who wrote the secret in the chip produce the correct results and this is how you authenticate and this is how you can get rid of counterfeits or at least harden it because only the manufacturer of the toner cartridge which puts the secret in the toner chip should know the secret and be able to generate the message authentication code which should match to this one so we saw that it reads memory page zero then it reads again memory page one it's the same thing in here but although it uses read authenticated page we see it doesn't read out the message authentication code simply because well it doesn't know the rom id so it wouldn't be able to actually verify if this mac was right or not because you need the rom id so here it reads again the memory page one so i think in the beginning it reads it unauthenticated just to know what kind of toner chip it is and to do some selection but i don't really know but once it figured out what toner chip it is and how we could read it read through it it reads data memory page one then here it reads data memory page two here we have da -da -da, data memory page three which are actually this is all the data there is on it there is there are four banks of memory data which are programmable and then there are other values which you can see here so in this case it reads the memory without authentication code but this is just to verify the status of the secret and and so on in this case each byte corresponds to one particular protection so for example this one means that the secret is write protected because it is set to AA or 55 then the secret is write protected so you cannot write a new secret on the chip you lock the secret this way this is just the write protection of the pages so they are not enabled because it's not AA or 55 this is the user byte this is not protected it's just FF here we have the factory byte 55 doesn't mean anything it's not important here we have something interesting this is the eprom mode control for memory page one eprom mode means that whenever you write into memory page one you can only transform a bit one into a bit zero and this is rather useful if you want to just have a value which decrements for example because you can only transform from one to zero this tells us that uh, here there's a value which gets only decremented in bit fields this gives us a clue that memory page one is actually including the toner level or at least this is just an indication it doesn't have to be the case but this chip has been designed for this purpose so it would make a lot of sense when you use the eprom mode you actually use it to store the toner level here we have the write protection of page zero this tells us that page zero has some static data which is just there to identify the type probably but it doesn't have some value which is changed for example for the toner level because this is write protected and then we have the user byte or the manufacturer id and the uh, factory byte and uh, 
they're not really important. But we get a pretty good look at at the traffic which is in there. And it seems to be secured because it even verifies if the secret is written, if the EEPROM is there. And the EEPROM data, so probably the toner level, which is at memory page one, so this one, is authenticated. We've seen that you can only decrement it, but even for decrementing this value, you would have to need the secret. And that's the other important point. Whenever you want to write data, if it's not write protected, you also need yourself to provide the to provide the message authentication code. Because the printer knows the secret, it can compute this message authentication code and provide it when writing. The toner chip will actually verify it. And if it verifies and if it matches, then the data is written. If it doesn't match, then no luck and the data is not written. Looking at this, it seems to be a pretty secure way to store the toner level and prevent uh, counterfeit cartridges. They're using the chip in a quite secure way. Or are they? Well, we should check this first. So what I did here is use a microcontroller and I've programmed it to simulate this chip. So this microcontroller now is a one-wire slave. We know how the protocol looks like because we wrote the protocol decoder and we have the data sheet. We know how the DS2432 works and we are pretty sure that this is a DS2432 clone or variation. And I've implemented everything here. Now this is connected to the printer and we can try to fuzz the printer to see if it does all the checks correctly. It seems to do it, but we still need to be sure. So whatever we do is now change the code, enable the printer, and you will see that there's some activity. Whenever this is blinking, there's some activity. Here the printer is now starting. You can see it is starting. And here there's some blinking, telling that there's some communication. If you look at the results here, you see that the printer is ready, but there is some issue with the toner. So the toner is low and here there's an error message. This means that the toner chip has an issue. We can still use SIGROC to trace the communication between the printer and our implementation of the DS2432. But because we have our own implementation of the DS2432 in the microcontroller, we could just add debug output to display the messages which are really important and we, which we want to debug. So let's start the printer and let's see the communication on both sides. So it needs a bit to warm up, to initialize, to boot up. And here we see already the communication of the printer. Now let's check why there is an error. And as you can see, da -da -da, let's go to the top. This is the beginning. And this is the beginning. We can see that we show the same thing, but not the same way. For example, this data corresponds to this data, but I, for example, I don't show the ROM ID. And here, which should normally happen here. But this is not important. Also, if you checked, this ROM ID is not the same ROM ID than the original chip. So this shows again that I could set it to whatever we want. So let's have a look at the trace and see why it fails. So let's go back to the top here. We have read authenticated page of memory page one. This is what we already also saw on the previous trace. This works pretty well. Then normally we have the ROM ID read, which I skipped here because this is not a function command. This is just a ROM command. Then we have the write scratch pad and the read authenticated page on memory page zero. Now it should read, it should do the same thing, but for memory page one. But as you can see here, the target address is still 00. zero. So this is memory page zero. We will have it one time, two times, three times, and four times. And after that, it restarted the microcontroller or the procedure, because here we can see it reads memory page one without setting the challenge. And this is the beginning again of the chip is as it tries again to do the same procedure all over. So here we can see it writes the scratch pad, tries to read the authenticated page at page zero, one time, two times, three times, four times, and then it stops. And this is the error. So we know that something is wrong with the read authenticated page and something failed. Well, if you think about it, it makes sense because this, when it reads the authenticated page, we send the Mac. And somehow we now know that it is 
it cares about the Mac. What I wanted to test here is that the driver might still ask for the Mac because this is how it's implemented, but on the top of it, the application might just disregard the Mac. It would be stupid, but we still need to test it just to be sure that they didn't make such an obvious error. And they didn't. So here we can we are pretty sure that because I don't have the right secret key, I cannot send the correct Mac. And here it is really checking if the send data corresponds to the Mac. And it is failing because I don't have the right thing. This is why it tries three times. Now, why try three times? Maybe it thinks that the communication had an error. But for that, normally you should just check the CRC. This is the CRC of the data and this is the CRC of the Mac. If they correspond, normally the communication went pretty well. But they're still asking four times and then rebooting and asking four times. But what we can be sure of is that it is checking the Mac. The next attack I would go for is simply a replay attack. What we just need is a correct Mac, but we don't have the secret key. But the original chip has the secret key. So what we could do is just ask the original chip for this data and this Mac. So we would ask a cartridge which is not empty and we will get its data and the corresponding Mac. And we could just replay this to the printer whenever it initializes. initializes. The problem with that is that the chip makers are also not that stupid. If this is why you're writing a challenge. So the challenge is individual and it is input into the Mac calculation. So the printer uses almost every time a random new challenge. Sometimes it is repeating, but this is very infrequent. And since this challenge is used in the calculation of the Mac, you would need one Mac per page. There are four pages per challenge. And each challenge is three bytes long. So in total, you would need 1.3 gigabytes of just Mac values. It's not too much though. Um, you could plug an SD card in your microcontroller, ask the original chip for all the data, so for all the Mac values, for the four pages with this data, you can ask for, for the Mac, save it, and then just replay it. And this is quite a valid attack, and it would work. Afterwards, it would probably decrement the number the toner level, but we don't care about this. We could just accept the command of decrementing and just in fact ignore whatever it does. The next time it reboots, we just reuse the value which is in there. And this probably will work, but this is not the finest solution. Let's look at other ways to hack the printer. Let's try to read out the key out of this chip. And for that, I'll use the best pirate. This is a quite nice little tool which is able to talk a lot of protocols or the main protocol. One of them is one wire. So here we just have a one wire master device which allows us to actually talk one wire this, to this chip. Here we are connected to the bus pirate and I've already set it to the one wire mode. So now the bus pirate is acting as a one wire master device and we can talk to the toner chip. Now here we have the command and if we look at it this bracket square bracket means send a reset pulse and read out the detect or the presence pulse. Afterwards, you send this byte, the 0xcc. This is the ROM function command for skip ROM because we only have one device on it. Afterwards, we are sending the memory function command F0. This is for read memory. And we want to read out the memory at page one, which is at address 20. Since it is least significant byte first, we are sending 20 and then 0, 0 for 0x20 zero at total. And afterwards, we read the 32 bytes of this memory. And there we have it. And this corresponds to the data we saw in the trace at the beginning. Now, we want to read out the key. And the key is stored at address x80, hexadecimal 80. And the data sheet says you shouldn't be able to read it. But maybe the guy who implemented the data sheet did a mistake and didn't put this protection on. Or even more, because this is not an original DS2432, the one who did the clone or the ripoff also forgot to do it. Or maybe it's just a rebranding, we don't know, but we, we still have to check it to ensure that. So let's read memory at page 80. And since it's only eight bytes long or 64 bits, let's try to see what it gives. And we are not lucky. It's only FFs. This is not 
the secret. So I've tried it and uh, it is not it. This is just telling that you're not able to read the secret. And after some more fooling around and playing with implementation, if we start the printer, I was able to pass authentication. So if you can see here, once it's finished reading out the chip, it read out the chip, we can see tonalo, but there is no error. This means that my implementation was able to pass authentication. Since now it's able to pass authentication, what we can do is play with the EEPROM content because we can, I can change it at will. So I'll play with the bits and the bytes and try to get rid of this Tona low LED. And I'll start with page one because this is where the EEPROM mode has been enabled. So this is a good clue where you should start it. And now if I flush the device, it should be flashed now. And if I enable it again, it goes through the check. We will have to wait until it reads everything. So here it reads everything and ta-da! I was able to fool the printer and let it think that there is toner again and the toner chip is not low. Thanks to passing the authentication and finding out where the memory content, where the toner level is. But I'm not sure if it's the toner level, but I found something in page two which was able to let the printer think that there is still some toner and printing works nice. You can now make the machine think you will never run out of powder again. But it's harder to fool the real world and at one point or another you will eventually run out of it. But at least now you are not bound to an exclusive supplier. You can choose your own dealer to refill your stock. And when there's competition, prices are more affordable. Probably at the cost of quality. But is this chip really needed? Here I've connected back the original chip, which says that the toner is low. So here I've sent a complete black page. It's receiving the data, although it's completely black, has to calculate something. And it is printing. You have to help a bit, because it's an old printer. And here I have the result, and we'll corner it to market. This is printing now with the toner not empty. And it looks like this. And if you compare the two ones, this is the one with the low printer, this is the one with no low toner. I don't see a difference. So in this case, you actually don't need uh, a new chip. Just refilling the printer is good enough because this printer allows you to print although the toner is low. But not all printers allow you to do that. Some printers will just block or block after a while. And this is where you need such a chip if you want to refill yourself the toner. Now I'm definitely not the only one having thought about this. This printer cartridge market is pretty juicy. And you can already find chips which do this. For example, this one. I got this one for $1.50. And this comes with a microcontroller. In this case, it's a microchip PIC-12A-12F683. And they basically just redid what I did. Re-implement the one-wire slave protocol and add a secret key to it. Let's find out if they implemented the DS2432 datasheet correctly and if they are protecting the secret. So let's connect it to the bus pirate and try it out to read the key over the one wire protocol. Let's first read the ROM ID of this counterfeit toner chip. And as we can see, this is different than the one we had in the original one. Now, let's try to read out the secret. And as we can see, the secret is still protected. The secret should be at the same address, but it doesn't allow us to read the secret. Now, because we can just read out the whole memory content and it looks like this. As you can see also, the ROM ID is also at the end of the memory. And this is also what is specified in the data sheet. It's just another way to read it out. Now this didn't work, but since they're using a PIC microcontroller, 
why not use the pick kit and try to read out the firmware out of it. Now let's use pickkit2 command to find out if the chip is actually detected and yes, it detects that this is a pick 12 f 683 Now let's dump everything to see if we can and this takes a bit of time but the operation succeeded. This mainly means that there is no protection bit so actually we could read the complete firmware. But just for the sake of it and because we can just read out the EEPROM because this PIC device has flash and 256 bytes of EEPROM. So let's dump the EEPROM and this is the content. But wait a minute. This is the ROM ID which we just saw of the EEPROM and it's at the right address. And also if you look at the remaining data, it is the same that we dumped over one wire. But here is a difference. At this address, 0x80, where the secret sh should be, it is there and it is here in clear. This time it is not encrypted. And this time we can completely read out the, the key. And if you, if you paid enough attention, you should have seen that uh, in my implementation we also used this ROM ID simply because I reused this key. I didn't find the key myself from the original chip. I extracted the key from the counterfeit chip, which was not protected. And what is important is that this key can only work with this ROM ID. Each ROM ID has its own key. This is a nice trick because this means that if you're cloning a chip or if you're extracting the key out of this chip, you cannot just put it in another chip because each of these DS2432 chip have their own IDs. So whatever you extract from one chip, you cannot put simply in another one. And this is also why they had to re-implement the whole stack and the whole DS2432 instead of just buying this chip. Because this way they can actually burn or set the ROM ID from the one which they dumped the key from and reuse the key which they dumped. And that's also what I did. I reused this ROM ID, I reused the key, and it works pretty well. And with this, we can completely change the memory, what we did to find out where the toner level is. Now, the question is, how did they dump the key? Well, I might show you in another episode how this could be done. It is a bit more elaborate, and I chose the simple way. Take a toner, a fake toner chip, and actually um, dump the key out of there to see if it was possible because whenever you hack a device you just try to find the path of least resistance and in my case this was it. So what did we learn in the end? Printer cartridges don't have sensors inside to measure the remaining amount of toner. The same applies to inject cartridges. It's far too complicated and far too expensive to do that. Instead they have a chip which stores the amount of remaining toner or the amount of remaining ink. And then the printer calculates how much it used and updates the value on the chip. The chip also has some security because you don't want to have counterfeit items or at least they don't want to have counterfeit items and uh, risk their revenue. But people already looked at it and you can already find a lot of these counterfeit chips for refills or for, renewed, for renewing your printer cartridge. And it is definitely worth to add yourself toner to it. In my case, I didn't even need this chip because I can print although the printer says that the toner is low. But I still was interested in how they work and how these chips actually work. This is why I implemented everything and discovered that it uses a DS24032 and how this works. It is Quite a, a lot of effort though to, to do all of this, particularly when you can buy this for less than $2. But if you're in this business and if, or if such kinds of chips don't exist or if you want to sell them before otherwise they exist, it probably is worth it because the cartridge market and the printer cartridge market, there are still some money out of it. But what is important is that refilling the cartridge is not the only thing which is important. 
what you change is the whole unit here and the whole unit also includes also includes this drum for example and it is important because this also gets used with time this is what you can see here my printer is printing garbage now you see all these lines this is because the drum is quite old and not as reliable again so if you want to have good prints you also need to change these from time to time but because printer cartridges cost almost as much as the printer themselves I think I'll get rid of this one and get a new one toner to toner dust to dust this printer reached the end of its service life it printed data sheets circuit layouts and even incantations but it is now time to rest in peace you may now bag it I'm sure there's still some pretty good parts in there.